Hello, and thank you for attending my presentation. My name is Mark Frederick, and on behalf of my co-authors, Rohan Geji, Carson Slaybaugh, and Joe Shepard, I'd like to present to you our work, Statistical Analysis of Detonation Wave Structure. Now, we often begin our analysis of detonations by considering simplified models, the first of which is the chapman jugay model. Now, this model is zero-dimensional um, and does not take into account the uh, chemical kinetics. However, by only considering the initial state conservation laws and the thermodynamic properties, it's able to accurately predict the wave speed at some state too. Now, in order to consider the reaction zone, the, a more complex model, the Z and D model is required. This model is one dimensional and steady, but um, it, it's still able to provide many useful parameters that we can use to study more complex detonations. Some of these are the induction length, which is the distance between the shock front and the peak energy release, and the exothermic length, which is the width of the energy release zone. Now, when we examine a real detonation, such as shown in the bottom left, the front may look 1D. However, as soon as we jump behind the shock, there's clearly more complexity than the 1D model uh, suggests. This is because our ideal models are unstable to local disturbances and manifest a cellular structure such as shown here for this weakly unstable mixture. These cells provide a history of the amplification and decay of the shock speed and reaction kinetics. Now, as the mixture instability increases, uh, as we get for this strongly unstable mixture on the right, the structure of the cellular pattern becomes irregular, and our local structures diverge from the descriptions provided by the simplified models. Now, in this work, we hope to provide a statistical approach uh, beyond a qualitative observation of, of soot foils like this to understand the level of mixture instability. The experiment used for this work is the narrow channel facility, a high aspect ratio channel that suppresses the 3D components of cellular instability in order to generate a flow that is more amenable to imaging. This experiment is single shot. Uh, the, the gases are loaded by the method of partial pressures. We're able to circulate these gases for a few minutes before uh, detonation initiation in order to ensure a well mixedness. Now, the experiment is schematically shown in the top left here. Uh, the, the test mixture uh, lives in th this three meter section and is detonated by a dynamic initiation of equimolar acetylene and oxygen. Uh, the detonation progress is monitored by three pressure transducers at the head end, which monitor wave planarity, and five downstream, which are used to monitor the wave speed based on the method of time of arrivals. Now, in this work, we're going to take a look at 16 mixtures, which are shown in the table on the right. These mixtures are broken up into three categories. Stoichiometric methane and oxygen diluted with nitrogen, argon, and methane, oxygen, nitrogen uh, sensitized with various amounts of ethane, ranging from 3 to 30 percent by volume. We chose these mixtures to purposely vary the one-dimensional stability parameters shown here on the right in the right two columns. This is delta I over delta E, the ratio of the induction length to the exothermic length, and theta, the non-dimensional activation energy. These are metrics for, the, for mixture stability. In order to study both the gas dynamic and chemical kinetic aspects of the flow, which is critical to understanding the detonation, simultaneous 5 MHz Schlieren and broadband chemiluminescence were performed using two Shimatsu HPV X2 cameras. Now, the Schlieren setup is shown on the right. Uh, it begins with a light source reflecting off an F over 10 parabolic mirror traveling through the test section before being focused onto the camera. This is a folded Z-type Schlieren setup. Now our chemiluminescence is taken out along a coincident field of view uh, by angling the camera about nine degrees underneath the beam path of the Schlieren. In the bottom left image is a picture of our pulsed light source, um, which pulses at around 635 nanometers with 15 nanometer bandwidth. The Schlieren cutoff we use is a circular cutoff. On this slide, what's playing is some sample images of what the analysis will be performed on in this work. The leftmost is a Schlieren image. In the middle is our broadband chemiluminescence, and on the right is an overlay of the two. Now, what's immediately apparent in these images is the great deal of complexity we're able to see. Uh, we can see the, some defining structures of all detonations, 
such as, well, we're about to see it set up. We have a high speed shock entering from either side of the frame and the transverse waves are moving towards each other as this low speed shock decays. We're also able to see in the middle just a great deal of complexity within the chemiluminescence as we look at these small reaction pockets that explode uh, near the end of the cell cycle. On the right, when the, when the fields are overlaid, we're able to study their coupling together and see that as the, as the leading front slows down and decays, the chemiluminescence moves further and further back, whereas in the high-speed portions of the front, the chemiluminescence remains attached. In order to perform our statistical analysis, the leading edge of the shock front is extracted from the Schlieren images, as shown by this green line. Uh, the extraction is done using a combination of a sober kernel, a marching squares, contour fitting, and an active contour model. As we can see, the green line uh, accurately tracks the shock front, um, and in the bottom here we have some still frames showing the same video that's playing up top. Now once the edges are extracted from all images, the spatial gradient is computed and the normal shock velocity is calculating using a central finite difference method along all points of the leading front for every image. This approach takes into account the local curvature of the wave. For here, a velocity map is generated, which is shown in the middle for a mixture of hydrogen, oxygen mixed with nitrogen. This mixture was selected for illustrative purposes uh, due to the regularity of the cells. Now it gives a representation very similar to a soot foil, as we can see by the triangular cell patterns. However, it also captures velocity oscillations um, of the leading front. Shown in this video is the path through two cell centers that, that run adjacent, traced out by the blue line and the red line. What we can watch um, as, as the point travels this path is the acceleration and decay of the leading shock. Uh, we could see it accelerates rapidly, followed by a long period of decay, and then this process repeats. Now with the velocity computed along all points of the leading front of each case, we're able to collapse those velocities into a statistical set by combining at least two cases taken at identical mixture conditions. This yields about 110,000 velocities uh, per mixture condition studied. Now once we have this statistical set, we're able to uh, generate probability distributions as is shown in the top row and corresponding moments for each mixture shown on the right. Now, if we take a look at our mixtures, beginning with our nitrogen case in the left column, we can study what happens as the amount of dilution is increased. Our one-dimensional neural stability parameters predict that as dilution is increased, uh, we ex expect to see higher levels of instability. And this is reflected in the PDFs. At no nitrogen dilution, we see a nearly a Gaussian PDF. But as uh, our nitrogen dilution is increased, uh, these, these PDFs skew towards the left, as well as the bulk slightly moves towards the left as well, towards sub-CJ speeds. Uh, this is reflected in the moments. The mean remains near CJ speed, slightly decreasing as dilution is increased. The higher moments, uh, the variance in the skew, skewness, mu2 and mu3, show a positive correlation with mixture uh, instability as dilution is increased, mixture instability is increased and, and our variance in skewness increase as well. Now what this means is that uh, for more unstable mixtures, they're able to access regions of both more extreme lower and higher velocity. Now taking a look at our argon diluted cases shown in the middle column, we see a, a different trend than what we saw with nitrogen. Argon, the addition of argon actually stabilizes the mixture. Uh, and this is reflected in the PDFs. Whereas with our nitrogen cases, as dilution was increased, they, they took on a high level of skewness. We see that they remain uh, nearly normal distributions, but shift slightly to the left as the, as the bulk of the distribution becomes slightly sub-CJ. Again, taking a look at the moments, we see that, that the mean uh, decreases slightly as dilution is increased, but the, the higher moments remain nearly constant. Now this stabilizing effect is, is caused because argon decreases the level of, of instability and reduces the temperature in the reaction zone 
and also decreases the induction time, allowing the mixture to have a lower kinetic sensitivity. Now, finally, uh, the ethane sensitized methane oxygen nitrogen mixture is shown in the right column. Now, as we add more ethane, uh, this has a, a stabilizing effect on, on the mixture, like the argon, but for a much different reason. Uh, ethane decreases the level of instability by sensitizing the mixture uh, and allowing it to more easily undergo hydrogen abstraction. This reduces the kinetic bottleneck of methyl radical production. Taking a look at the PDFs, we see that for no dilution, we have some skewness and the bulk of the distribution shifts to the left. But as we, as we increase the amount of ethane, the mixtures shift towards the right and become nearly Gaussian at, at 30%. Now we see that our mean remains uh, near CJ for all these mixtures and our higher moments decrease as the mixture is stabilized by more ethane addition. Now, so far in this work, we have only considered the shock front. We can, however, understand the coupling between the shock front and chemiluminescence front by extracting the chemiluminescence front in a method similar to the shock front. This is shown in this figure on the left um, and yields an effective chemical length scale, which is computed by taking the difference between our shock front shown in green and our chemiluminescence front shown in blue along the normal of the shock front. Now, with this uh, effective chemical length scale computed, we can create joint PDFs shown in the bottom row of the figure on the right that compare the normalized effective chemical length scale by the normalized shock speed. Uh, three mixtures are shown here. We have our, our, our methane oxygen nitrogen diluted mixture, argon diluted, and a 5% ethane sensitized mixture. In terms of stability, the mixture on the left and the nitrogen mixture is the most unstable, uh, followed by argon, followed by our ethane sensitized mixture. Looking at these velocity maps, we can see the, uh, the impact of this instability. In the top left here for the nitrogen mixture, we're able to see the cellular structure, uh, but we're also on top of this, thanks to, thanks to being able to see the velocity, we can see the, the large oscillations. We have regions of, of extremely high velocity and extremely slow velocity. Taking a look at the argon as the mixture becomes more stable, the cell pattern begins to look more regular. And in addition, the, the velocity oscillations are not nearly as extreme. This is similarly the case for the ethane mixture shown on the right, except now that the cells are harder to make out because the, the structure has become uh, very small. But again, we see, we see less regions of, uh, of extreme velocity. Now, when we take a look at the joint probability di distributions shown in the bottom row here, we can compare, uh, we can compare the probability with the quasi-steady solution. The quasi-steady solution is shown as this black line and is computed with the uh, constant pressure model. Now, what we see for our nitrogen mixture is that in high speed portions of the flow, it, it, it pretty closely follows this quasi-steady solution. But in low speed portions, uh, this is not the case. It appears that the, the mixture, um, the, the effective chemical length scale is much shorter than what would be predicted by our quasi-steady solution. Our argon mixture in the middle um, shows what happens when, when the mixture is more stable. But again, in the high speed portions, it, it follows the flow, it follows, excuse me, the quasi-steady solution. But as, as the mixture drops below CJ speed, it follows our quasi-steady solution to a point, although this is still a relatively unstable mixture um, and the mass of the distribution is to the left of the quasi-steady line. A similar effect is seen for our ethane mixtures. Um, Again, this is stabilized with with regards to our our pure methane mixture, um, and we can see how the uh, the PDF only only slightly follows the quasi-steady solution. And again, the mass of the distribution is shifted left. This this allows us to conclude that you know, unstable mixtures can really only be treated as quasi-steady in periods where the lead shock is overdriven. Overdriven, they must be treated as fully unstable. Uh, in these underdriven regions and do not follow um, the predictions of a 1D shock ignition. Now in the bottom of the slide are the three videos that show uh, the, the mixtures that we looked at on the previous slide. 
in this you can see how the the level of instability manifests in the the shock oscillations as well as the chemiluminescence front oscillations now using the images we we took in this work which were which were five megahertz imaging of both the gas dynamic and chemical fields uh, leveraging their their high spatial and temporal resolution we were able to generate a statistical analysis uh, and quantify the degree of mixture instability across a range of highly unstable mixtures. We showed a positive correlation between the probability moments and 1D instability parameters. We were then able to consider the chemiluminescence front in conjunction with the, the shock front um, to demonstrate the effect of mixture composition on the extent of coupling between the energy release zone and the shock front. Now these results uh, demonstrate the value of our experimental methodology to quantitatively describe detonation front instability. And they further motivate work to interrogate the higher order processes occurring within the reaction zone that are not predicted by our simplified one dimensional models. I would like to thank a few organizations for supporting this work and my ability to attend this conference. First off is the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship Program. I'd also like to thank uh, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research for the DREP grant that was used to purchase the equipment to perform this work. I'm also thankful to Hadland Imaging for support with the Shimatsu HPV X2 cameras. And I'd also like to acknowledge the Combustion Institute, the Central States Combustion Institute, the National Science Foundation, and the Purdue Graduate Student Government for providing support that has allowed me to attend this conference. Thank you for your time.